Hey everybody, welcome back to A View from Earth, brought to you by the Fisk Planetarium at CU Boulder. Hope you're all doing well and staying safe. As with the rest of the university and many public spaces around the world, Fisk Theater is closed to the public for the foreseeable future due to the COVID-19 epidemic. However, we are still so committed and excited to bring astronomy and education to you that we've started a whole host of free online offerings so that we can stay connected and keep bringing you the FIS content that you know and love, plus some new stuff like this podcast. So thanks for tuning in and learning with us today. My name is Tara. I'm a CU alum and a planetary scientist. I'm also a presenter at FISC and uh, help run our outreach program there. And my co-host here, Colin. Colin, tell us about yourself. Hey, everyone. I'm Colin. I am a CU student. I'm an undergrad in astronomy. And I'm also a presenter at FISC when the building is open. And of course, here I am co-hosting this podcast with Tara. So that's the other thing I do. Thanks, Colin. So today we are talking more about the sun. You probably heard from us a little about the sun a couple of weeks ago. Well, we're going to talk even more about it. Specifically this time, we're focusing a little more on the activity of the sun, some solar flares, and some flares and activity on other stars as well. So we've got excerpts from interviews with Dr. Adam Kowalski and Dr. Maria Kazachenko. So we're going to play a couple of those for you. So now we are talking with Dr. Adam Kowalski. Uh, Dr. Kowalski has been at CU since 2016 when he joined the National Solar Observatory and the Department of Astrophysical and Planetary Sciences as an assistant professor. Uh, his research interests lie in solar and stellar astrophysics. He's got a specialization in spectroscopy of optical and ultraviolet emissions in stellar flares. He uses state-of-the-art modeling codes combined with analysis of data from ground and space-based observatories like Hubble, IRIS, and the APO ARC 3.5 meter telescope. Uh, uses those to understand how the lower dense stellar atmosphere is heated in response to the sudden release of magnetic energy during flares. He's also interested in developing new media for the dissemination of scientific results to the public and in establishing collabor collaborations across disciplines. This is a whole big thing. So thank you so much, Adam, for joining us today. Oh, well, thanks a lot for having me. We are super stoked. So I figured we'd start off with maybe kind of an easy question, but people don't always realize that the sun actually has layers. The sun and most other stars too, uh, having things like a core and an atmosphere and whatnot. So can you kind of give us a quick rundown on the structure of our sun? How is it made up? Sure, yeah. So. Uh, let's start at the center of the sun, uh, where all the energy um, that we get at Earth ultimately originates. Um, the center of the sun is called the core, um, and it's so hot and dense there that um, hydrogen nuclei uh, slam together and fuse um, into helium nuclei, um, and this releases a lot of energy, um, and this is what uh, eventually escapes uh, the sun and reaches Earth, um, but it's a pretty complicated story actually. From from uh, starting at uh, fusion and then reaching our you know our skin while we're on a, a, the beach getting tan. Um, so um, after fusion, there's energy that's released and it keeps the core hot. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, uh, radiated energy or just light. Um, starts making its way out um, uh, of the core. And it kind of bounces around in uh, packets of energy um, called photons. Um, uh, and it bounces around for quite a while. Um, at some point, then, it kind of takes an elevator ride the rest of the way to the surface of the sun. Um, and this elevator ride is through a process called convection, basically. Um, heat rises. Um, so similar to how water boils in the stove, um, there's hot pockets um, of air that bubbles to the surface on our stove. There's hot pockets of plasma that bubbles to the surface of the sun, carrying this energy, um, which ultimately was produced in the core itself. Um, <clears throat> by the time it reaches the surface, though, um, 
it's uh, the material has significantly cooled off and the core is about 15 million degrees, whereas um, the surface of the sun uh, where the energy boils to the surface um, is about 6,000 degrees. Um, is still this a very high or a Celsius there or Kelvin? This is um, uh, approximately Celsius. Okay, okay. Yeah, yep. So uh, scientists, we, we tend to just talk in degrees. Uh, we use Kelvins, um, which is uh, 270 degrees from Celsius. So I'm talking in thousands and millions. So it's essentially Celsius. Um, <clears throat> So um, by the time this energy boils to the surface, um, it'll eventually uh, reach a point where uh, light can now escape these pockets of, of, of plasma, all right? And this um, part of the sun is called the photosphere. And this is what we call as the visible surface of the sun. Um, <clears throat> it's very bright, obviously. Um, and, but surprisingly, it's not a surface at all. It's actually about a hundred kilometers thick. And um, the plasma here, um, partially ionized gas here, is about a hundred times less dense than the air around us. Um, but because it's so hot and because it's made of hydrogen, it glows very brightly. Um, and uh, from here on out, the light can then escape essentially directly to uh, the earth um, and then our eyes. Um, <clears throat> and this is the visible light that, uh, that can escape. Um, <clears throat> we know though that this is not the end of the story for certain other types of light. Um, so the, from the photosphere, the temperature then drops off um, from about 6,000 to about 5,000 degrees. And you'd expect then it the temperature to keep dropping off, you know, to the temperature of space, which is near absolute zero. But in fact, it doesn't. Uh, <clears throat> from here on, from the photosphere outward, is what we call the solar atmosphere. Um, the density decreases, then the temperature decreases. Surprisingly, the temperature starts increasing again. Uh, this is very strange. Um, so if you start on the, uh, you know, the surface of the earth, the temperature is, you know, a nice, um, you know, uh, 80, 90 degrees today in Boulder, Fahrenheit. Um, but if you go and climb a mountain, a 14er, um, the temperature cools off and it gets cold. You need a parka, okay? This is what we expect to happen um, with the sun's atmosphere. But in fact, at some point it starts getting hotter again. Um, it increases in temperature to about 6,000, then to 10,000 degrees. And this is what we call the chromosphere and it actually shines very brightly in red light. Um, then suddenly, about 2,000 kilometers above where the energy initially boiled to the surface, um, the temperature suddenly jumps to a million degrees. And uh, this has been a longstanding mystery um, why this happens. Um, and we think uh, that it's due to uh, the fact that the sun is actually a magnetic monster. There are magnetic fields uh, sticking out everywhere in the surface of the sun. And in certain regions, the magnetic fields are stronger and they're tangled and they can um, store and release energy, causing certain regions of the solar atmosphere to be hotter than what we expect, as hot as millions of degrees. And this outer, what we call a layer, it's a very large region outside, um, uh, the solar surface is called the corona, and it shines brightly in X-rays. Um, <clears throat> so it, that's in general um, the uh, uh, story of the sun from the the core to the corona. <clears throat> so I kind of will move in the direction kind of of your research. You kick things off with the question of what is a solar flare. Sure. So um, <clears throat> the, a solar flare. Uh, in a few words, is just a, a burst of light from the solar atmosphere. Great. Um, that's now so that's bad. that's that's all it is. It the the light comes in various forms. It comes in optical um, at optical wavelengths. It comes in X rays, radio. Radio waves um, are produced in uh, during a solar flare, ultraviolet. So it's really uh, it's a burst of light across the entire electric electromagnetic spectrum. Crazy. And in particular, you look at 
these solar flares in optical and UV mostly. So what kind of different things do you learn looking at them with these two different wavelength regimes? Right, so actually uh, it comes back to the previous question, we learn about the temperature. Um, so <clears throat> uh, by measuring the amount of UV light compared to the amount of optical light, we can get a temperature of the flare. Um, and what we typically see is uh, very dense regions of the atmosphere um, become very hot, uh, about 10,000 degrees. So you go from about 6,000 degrees to about 10,000 degrees um, by measure, um, through measuring the amount of UV to optical light. And we also get the density. We find that this is very dense. Um, and uh, when we run com computer models, it's very hard to increase uh, this amount of material, this density of material to 10,000 degrees from 6,000 degrees. So in order to study these stars, you know, both our sun and these, these you know, other stars that are not our sun that are, you know, further out from us, uh, we, we use telescopes, right? That's kind of the astronomer's view into the universe. And you do a bit of work with ground-based telescopes, including the brand new Daniel K. Inoue telescope in Hawaii. Uh, uh, what are some of the features of DKIST, that's what, you know, the, the acronym, uh, that solar scientists are so excited about? Yeah, um, so uh, there are a number of aspects to this um, telescope. Um, uh, <clears throat> one is that it has a, uh, a brand new suite of instruments. Um, and uh, you can operate almost all of them at the exact same time. So you basically have um, a Swiss army knife um, for looking at the sun. Um, you can look at it in a bunch of different ways, um, meaning different wavelengths of light, different colors of light um, at the exact same time. Um, <clears throat> that's, and each of these instruments is like um, a super version of what we have currently um, on, on, on our best uh, ground-based telescopes here. Um, in addition, there are a couple uh, brand new um, uh, techniques entirely that are being used with uh, the DKIST uh, to study the sun. One, um, though it's an optical telescope, that it is, it will measure the light um, and uh, from uh, the blue all the way through the uh, near infrared. Um, <clears throat> uh, it will also um, be able to probe the corona now the corona is millions of degrees um, and it uh, radiates primarily in x-rays, okay? But there are some signatures in the optical and only with the DECA's new capabilities can we now um, uh, uh, measure certain properties of, of the corona. Um, it's really awesome now that we have such a huge mirror looking at the sun because we can start to see um, some of the, uh, what we call the fundamental scales or um, the most important scales um, that drive the physics. Um, How big is that mirror, by the way? Just really quick. It's about, it's four meters. In diameter. In diameter, okay. right, right, right. So um, <clears throat> what, what uh, new capabilities do the DKIST have looking at the corona and in the, uh, the photosphere, chromosphere? Um, well, it can measure not just the brightness of the light, but another property of light called the polarization of the light, okay? And this is uh, brand new um, for this type of observing. And what we can do with that is we can measure more than just the temperature and the density <clears throat> that we've been doing um, with uh, just the amount of you know, UV to optical light or X-ray light in one part of the X-ray band to another part of the X-ray band. But we can actually start to measure the magnetic fields and the electric fields in the sun. Um, we still, though the sun produces magnetic fields um, very, very well, and we see the sunspots, we have a very um, limited understanding of how these magnetic fields are generated and uh, what the strengths of these magnetic fields are throughout the atmosphere. 
Okay, we know that they're large in the photosphere and we know they're weak in the corona, but we really don't have an idea on you know, the, their, their strength throughout the entire atmosphere going from the photosphere to the chromosphere to the corona. Um, and we're, we're gonna be able to figure this out now. Um, so these are some of the um, uh, capabilities uh, uh, that will become um, readily available uh, uh, for solar physics um, in the 2020s here. I feel like we should give the obligatory for all listeners listening to this podcast. Do not look at the, do not look directly at the sun. Uh, it will lead to eye damage and we are not responsible for, uh, for any medical problems you have going forward after you listen to this episode. <laughs> So we also have this brand new spacecraft out there, Parker Solar Probe, that's been getting some really awesome solar data. Is Do you guys kind of work together with the spacecraft and the telescope, kind of planning observations or sharing data? Or there seems to be a lot of really cool stuff going on right now. Yeah, yeah. So there are collaborations um, being developed to coordinate um, observations with the uh, DKIST and uh, the Parker Solar Probe, the Parker Solar Probe taking measurements, local measurements of the fields, um, magnetic fields um, in the outer corona, um, and the electric fields and uh, the solar wind, um, and then the um, basically the D the DCAS will provide uh, very 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 fine detailed images of the surface, so that we have basically. You know, we're basically taking a thermometer with Parker Solar Probe to the outer corona, and we're taking very detailed pictures of the surface where these magnetic fields originate. And so we can get um, both, uh, you know, a, a local uh, picture of what's going on and see what's happening in the surface. So we can connect, you know, these very large range of distances from the surface all the way out. So it's going to be a really interesting combination of uh, what we call in situ temperature taking and um, uh, remote uh, taking spectra. Awesome. Well, Adam, in our last couple of minutes here, we always like to ask uh, our guests, was young Adam, I imagine you like standing in your kitchen talking to your parents and they ask, Adam, what do you want to be when you grow up? Was your answer a solar physicist from the get go or did that kind of develop uh, you know, as you kind of went through school? How did you get to where you are today? Yeah, uh, I did not uh, see myself going into solar physics, um, actually. Uh, I was interested in astronomy in general uh, since I was a kid. Um, my parents got me a telescope um, and um, uh, we'd go up to a, a, a beach um, resort um, during the summers and the skies were just amazing there. You could see to sixth magnitude, see the Milky Way. It was just amazing. And so that um, kept my interest going. Uh, this uh, just um, backyard astronomy, reading Sky and Telescope, um, watching Cosmos, uh, the Cosmos series by Carl Sagan, um, reading all of Carl Sagan's books, <laughs> uh, reading Kip Thorne's books, all these uh, really excellent um uh, books on uh, various aspects of astronomy, and then uh, then I uh, learned that uh, you had to be very good at physics to actually be a professional astronomer. Um, and then I majored in physics, um, and uh, in order, you know, to eventually go to grad school in astronomy, um, it was uh, pretty uh, difficult. And um, you know, during my college years, it was you know I kind of, you know, what am I actually interested in and things like that. And then my senior year, I got involved in a, in a research project um, with uh, Professor Dietrich Miller at the University of Chicago. And I just was really, really into the whole research thing, um, particular how he ran his group, um, the nature of the, the scientific uh, uh, exploration that he encouraged. Um, and I realized I want to apply for to grad school in astronomy. Um, and I went to the University of Washington, still not knowing what um, parts of astrophysics interest me. I did my, um, my research project in my undergrad on cosmic rays. 
um, particle detectors. So I was really interested in like particle physics aspects of astronomy. And then um, I, uh, I started doing a project on M dwarf flares um, in grad school um, with uh, Professor Suzanne Hawley there. Um, and just kind of became extremely interested in um, the fact that these M dwarf flares produce this blue and ultraviolet light um, with enormous luminosity and energy. And yet our computer models had essentially failed to produce anything like it. Um, and so I just really got involved in this, in, in, in stellar flares, M dwarf flares, um, towards the end of my PhD. Um, I started going to solar physics conferences because um, I knew that yeah, we really needed to observe and understand solar flares better um, in order to understand M dwarf flares better because we can see all this detail in the solar flares. And so that's how I, event I eventually got started in solar physics, um, kind of late, um, came from the, 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 the stellar side, um, sometimes what we call the dark side. And you've been riding that wave ever since. I've been riding that wave ever since. Yes. And yes. So how long have you been from the moment you started that project on M dwarfs that really like kind of set you in the direction? How long have you been doing solar physics? Um, I've been doing solar physics. Um, after grad school, I did a postdoc at NASA Goddard in the heliophysics science division there where I worked on the computer models um, with uh, Dr. Joel Allred. Um, and uh, we eventually got these computer models to reproduce the, the blue and near ultraviolet light that we observed in MDOR flares. And, you know, then we started extending our modeling approach to solar flares, making predictions for the DKIST. So that's kind of how it all fits together. We have all these new predictions for the DKIST, what it will see in these um, uh, bright uh, uh, kernels in the, in the photosphere or chromosphere of the, the sun. Um, and uh, uh, so I guess it'd be oof, probably nine years now um, from my first time observing uh, the sun at the Dunn Solar Telescope, uh, 2000, oh wow, oh wow, 2010, so 10 years. <laughs> Congratulations on one Thanks. decade of, of doing solar physics, that's awesome. Thank you. So to kind of wrap up our time here, any advice for a budding solar physicist, someone who's really inspired by this, someone who thinks this is super cool, what would you tell them to, where's a good place to start? So we have lots of data. We have lots and lots and lots of data that needs to be understood um, from last cycle um, of solar flares. Um, there are a lot of flares that need to be analyzed, understood, um, and we're looking for young eager um, scientists to take uh, these these data sets and just stare at them and then do some analysis and um, to uh, run some computer models. So all you need to do is email someone at the National Solar Observatory who does solar physics um, and will um, uh, get you started on a research project. Um, I would say that just look on the National Solar Observatory's webpage um, there are a list of names and contacts. You can contact me um, with your general interests. I can forward you to whoever um, you might be interested in working with. Um, so uh, I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, in addition, uh, solar physics is really great because um, almost all the data of the sun is nearly immediately public. So you can download the, uh, the data all types of data from the sun, just from the internet. You don't need a password, you don't need um, a credential. You can start looking at solar data right away um, and doing your own analysis, making your own fun movies. Uh, and I can get you started um, with several tools um, uh, for that. Um, so just, I guess, contact me and we can get you going with um, observing the sun. You know, that's something that we talked about, I think, with Fran Bagnall, is that right? That there is just, you know, this huge wealth of data that has no one has ever looked at before. And it's right there and it's free and it's accessible, but there's just so much of it that it's, you know, you, you yep. can be the first person to lay your eyes on it. And, right. 
Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So, you know, there are so many other aspects of solar physics in addition to studying its flares. Um, but the, I think the same phrase could be could we apply to all aspects of um, the sun's very interesting day-to-day -day life is uh, a phrase that my PhD advisor um, said is um, so, so many flares, so little time. Awesome. Well, Adam, thank you so much for being with us today on the podcast. It has been a pleasure to speak with you. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of people are going to be really excited to start looking into some, some solar physics. Oh, great. Yeah. Thanks a lot for having me. So now we are speaking with Maria Kozachenko, who is an assistant professor at CU Boulder and works in solar astrophysics. Her research interests range from the storage of magnetic energy in solar active regions to the release of that energy in solar flares, with an emphasis of comparison and integration of observations with simulations. Understanding how this energy is stored and released is necessary to predict solar eruptions and hence space weather. She is also involved in the development of the Critical Science Plan for the Daniel K. Inouye Space Telescope, I'm sorry, Solar Telescope, uh, which is uh, the largest four meter, meter telescope in the world and had its first light back in December of 2019, revealing stunning mega close up images of the sun's surface. Uh, Maria has received the NASA Early Career Fellowship, the NSF Career Award, and the uh, Robert Bartnick Fellowship. Uh, Maria, thanks so much for being with us today. Hi, Colin. Thank you so much for the invitation. Wow, the presentation has had lots of lots of words. I'm not sure whether anybody understood what. Yes, I know. Yeah, it was kind of a lot of like, wow, that's some cool space terminology. Uh, but hey, now we know who you are, right? And so and we'll get to know you a little bit over the next hour or so. Uh, so we'll jump right in with with one of the, the things that you research. Um, we talk about uh, solar active regions, right? That's kind of a, a, a term that we hear in astronomy class and in just the astronomy parlance. Uh, what is the difference between a solar active region and what I'm going to call a solar inactive region, if that's even a thing? What are we talking about here? So excellent question. Thank you so much. So historically, what do we know about the sun? Well, we know it's shining. You know, it's wormy, it's what brings us life. But then besides that, how do we figure out what's going on in the sun? So historically, when our first telescope, or even before that, when people were just watching on the sun, uh, they noticed, and you could even do it yourself, although it's not recommended looking bare and naked eye on the sun. But if there is a large um, sunspot or huge magnet on the sun, uh, then, uh, you could even see it with your naked eye, better with a filter. So historically, people have found that there are these dark spots on the sun that you could see if you look in the solar telescope, even at home, if you have a telescope and you just put a filter over it. So people have noticed that there, is, that there are these uh, darkening on the surface of the sun. And then later, when uh, technology has evolved, they figure out that these darkenings are just huge magnets, similar to what you have on your fridge just much, much, much bigger. And uh, later we found out that these huge magnets, magnets are the places where huge eruptions are happening. And people have called them solar active regions because of the eruptions that they host. So that means that there is active sun or it is magnets or active regions and inactive sun, which now we know is not true. <laughs> There is an active sun, which is non-boring, and then there is quiet sun, which is also not boring at all. In fact, um, you might recall there was an article, news article, all over the place just a couple of weeks ago from Solar Orbiter, a new instrument that has been launched from, by, um, from Cape Canaveral this year. And the Solar Orbiter, they have discovered that whole surface of the sun is covered by these tiny eruptions happening in the quiet sun meaning outside these huge active regions. So we could simplify our view on the sun that active sun is the place where magnetic field of the sun is strong, where you have these huge magnets. And then um, inactive sun or quiet sun that we call is the place where there is not much activity going on. Even though if you look at it, if you look at it from the earth, but if you look at it with a high resolution, everything is super active. Right. That seems to kind of be a theme with everyone that we talk with that, you know, 
th there's really nowhere in the solar system where something isn't happening that's interesting. Exactly. You know, on a star or, on a, or a planetary body, there's always something to kind of look at and be like, hmm, there's some activity going on. So that's and that's, cool. that's why we are always pushing for even higher resolution. <laughs> because you could find something super quiet that's not quiet at all. Sure, yeah, or you can look a little bit deeper always. Right. Very cool, mm -hmm. very cool. So, you know, all of this energy is being released and it's moving and towards the earth. How, how is that like electromagnetic energy or are these like actual particles that are heading our way? How is this yeah. energy being transferred? Excellent question. So as you mentioned, there are particles coming from these events. That's one thing. There is also light coming from these events. That's another thing. And then um, and all of these, they have very different speeds. So typically for particles, it takes days or oh, depends on which particles. But usually when you think that it takes light four and a half minutes to reach Earth. So once the flare happens, you could see the brightening in, uh, in four minutes. And uh, for, the, for the other forms, um, like for example, plasma with magnetic fields actually traveling towards us, those things are called coronal mass ejections. So these are huge clouds of plasma being ejected. For these things, it takes something between, on the scale of days. And scientists actually work super hard trying to predict when will this cloud of stuff arrive on the earth? And it's actually not straightforward at all. Sometimes it goes straight at you, sometimes it's curves, sometimes it interacts with other clouds on the way. And the problem is, the problem is that we don't have any measurements on the in-between. So we could observe something happening on the sun, we observe something near the earth, but in between there is really still poor understanding of what's going on. But I imagine these can get influenced by like gravity from other planets and things that are in between us too um yeah since i mentioned that uh, that's a very excellent point uh, and thank you for bringing it up um actually so this cloud is magnetic it has some mass but it's mostly really the magnetic field that guides the trajectory of this thing so usually what uh, what happens is that there is interaction of different uh, clouds magnetic clouds of stuff and sometimes this trajectory change because of this reconnecting magnetic fields the changes in the structure of the magnetic field it sounds all very sci-fi <laughs> um, but that's what it is sometimes one cloud eats the other one sometimes it deflects the other one the gravity of the planets doesn't change the trajectory so much i mean it of course it affects slightly but at least that's the predict in predictable way but what's really is uh, unknown is uh the the structure of these um, bubbles above the sun and the thing is that we cannot really directly observe them because they're all transparent so you know i know that this is kind of probably a very broad encompassing question but it sounds like kind of what we're talking about this the path between when when this this cloud leaves the sun and moves towards its direction you know towards earth or maybe just into space in general I, this is what we call space weather, right? Or let me ask you, Absolutely. actually, yes. what is space weather? If you, you know, as a space weather, a person that studies space weather, what would you, how would you, you know, what, what is space weather? Right. So let's first think, what's the earth weather? Earth weather is temperature, wind speed, what else? Um, rains, whether it would rain or not. How about space weather? Space weather is basically the same thing, but for properties of the space environment. What are the properties of the space environment? I said the magnetic field primarily, right? The speed of plasma. So then the density of this uh, stuff around or plasma. So these are the main thing that we want to predict. So space weather, that's what space weather is. How do we predict the states of the plasma outside the bubble of Earth magnetic fields? Why do we even distinguish between Earth weather and space weather? And the main reason for that is that Earth has magnetic fields. That means that our magnetic field on the Earth, uh, luckily for us, protects us from direct uh, solar environment in terms of magnetic fields. So everything inside is not affected by magnetic field of the or of the Sun. However, once you leave this so uh, the Earth magnetosphere, you have this environment that strongly depends on this eruptions, uh, coronal holes. Um, even cosmic rays. 
So we would like, if you would want to send anything into space, like a spacecraft or a human, we want to understand what are the properties of this plasma. Why do we want to understand? Because a large solar flare could kill our instruments or it could kill even our humans. So we want to use some kind of shielding or we want to be able to switch off the instruments before this cloud of um, magnetic field reaches uh, your instrument. So you mentioned that seems to be, you know, kind of the, the question that scientists are asking, why are we studying space weather? Well, so that, you know, we can understand what, what we're sending spacecraft into and, you know, and, and also just for the scientific reason of we, we're curious, we want to know why. Right. So the main goal of NASA is to send stuff into space. If you want right. to send anything into space, you want to know what's the weather is. Is right. it going to yeah. rain? You're not going hiking without knowledge of right. weather here in Colorado. Same totally. Thing outside. Mm -hmm. So, so, I, and you mentioned, you know, there's a couple of ways that we're doing this, right? Obviously, we, you mentioned that some, we have actually some spacecraft that are sent, you know, to the sun to study the sun. Uh, other than, than that, are, what other ways are we, are, you know, we being solar physicists and, and space, people that study space weather, I keep wanting to say space meteorologist. Is that a right, is that term correct? Oh, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Nice. Cool. All right, great. So I'll say it. How are space meteorologists studying the weather? What tools do you use to say, okay, well, here's how we're going to make our predictions and here's where we're getting our information from here, you know, similar to how we have weather stations here on Earth. Right. Uh, very good question. By the way, before I answer this question, I want to ask a question to you. Um, where do you think most of the, the uh, where do you think is the headquarter of Space meteorolo meteor meteorology in the Colorado in the in the United States. I'm gonna guess it's here in Colorado. Yay! I guess that would be my guess too. Yeah. So actually, in Boulder, the Space Weather Prediction oh, Center, what? the whole U.S. is located in Boulder. Yes. So we are here talking about from the from the headquarters of the Space Weather. So how do we predict space weather? Um, there are actually space meteorologists sitting in um, Space Weather Prediction Center here in Boulder. And what they try to do every morning is there is a real metho meteorologist uh, sitting there uh, looking at the state of the sun and trying uh, from different, mostly from experience, to figure out what would be the danger index or the space weather index uh, for, for the outside the Earth magnetosphere, for the area outside the Earth magnetosphere. And how does he or she do it? Uh, he uses images from uh, instruments, some of them developed here at CU Boulder, at LASP, uh, like GOES, uh, that observe flares on the surface of the sun um, in X-rays. Uh, we have plenty of instruments um, developed by NASA. Um, one of uh, the most famous one is Solar Dynamics Observatory. Uh, it's an instrument flying around Earth and observing the sun constantly, 24 hours, so constantly, looks, looking at the full disk of the sun. It looks at the sun at different levels, at different heights, at different temperatures. Uh, it looks at the magnetic fields, and from all of this, um, tries to get information of when the next flare would happen. In fact, today there was uh, there is a, um, there was a cover page with the sun uh, on the cover page about the flare prediction. If you go to the web, uh, if, if you go to the website of Science Journal, then you'll see that the front page is actually an image from Solar Dynamics Observatory, uh, and the title is that we improved our understanding of how to predict the largest flares. But uh, this area is a very hot topic of ongoing research. Can we really predict flares? For now, all uh, flare prediction models are not 100% um, certain. So as weather models, they're not perfect. And the uh, main difficulty with it is that here at Earth, we have all kinds of measurements of temperature, density, et cetera, et cetera here on Earth, and we are still doing sometimes bad job on predicting uh, Earth weather. With the space, it is uh, even worse because we only observe the sun remotely. Sun is huge, it's super dynamic, much more dynamic than Earth. Uh, it has all types of different scales and we only have a tiny point 
many, many kilometers away and we don't even have um, a way to stick the thermometer on the sun and figure out what's going on there on the surface. Which is a perfect segue into the next thing we wanted to ask you about, which is you, we mentioned in your intro, you were involved in the development of the critical science plan for the DECUS telescope. Can you tell us a bit about what the science plan is and what kind of things DECUS is looking at and looking for? Right. Uh, so what is DECUS? The DECUS um, is a Daniel K. Inoue Solar Telescope uh, that um, is being built and almost finished on Hawaii. Uh, on the top of the Mount Haleakala on the island of Maui. And uh, this will be the largest solar telescope in the universe probably. <laughs> it has, uh, uh, why do I say that it's a solar telescope? Because unlike most of the telescope, solar telescope observes the sun. And um, it has to do a bunch of tricks to be able to observe the sun because the sun is extremely bright. So you have to observe it without burning your instruments. It's the largest solar telescope in the world. It has a diameter, the mirror diameter is four meters. So it's really, really large. And um, it will be observing the sun with the highest ever spatial resolution. And even though DKIST has problems with the amount of light, there is a, uh, there is a funny problem of light starvation <laughs> that uh, uh, basically means that when you, try to get the light in a very, very narrow wavelength where you could observe your specific favorite phenomena, there is actually not enough photons. So that's one of the reasons the telescope has to be big so that you have the largest amount of light possible uh, to be able to study your um, phenomenon. So DKIST is a beast. What, is it, what do I mean by that is that it um, is extremely complex telescope. Um, it is uh, on the edge of innovations and technology. Uh, there are lots of technical tasks that have had been to be resolved to figure out how DKIST um, would work. There are many things besides resolution that we will observe for the first time. We will for the first time observe um, the magnetic field in the solar corona in the limb. Um, I haven't talked about solar corona this time, but solar corona is basically something that you see during solar eclipses. Um, when the sun, the solar disk blocks the center of the sun. When it happens, you could all of a sudden see that uh, there is this faint, super faint area around the sun called solar corona, which is basically this outer uh, magnetic fields in the solar atmosphere. And why are we interested in solar corona is because uh, uh, the solar corona tells us about the structure of the magnetic field. And it is the structure of the magnetic field that defines uh, what, when and how the solar flare would happen. And uh, so DKIST will bring us all the suite of four instruments, four, four or five instruments uh, to observe uh, different aspects of the sun. And the um, science group is trying to figure out what are the key questions that DKIST might answer. And um, because the instrument is so complex, so what has been done during the past several years is that National Solar Observatory, which is the main, uh, well, it's the US Solar Observatory that observes the sun that with the headquarters where in Boulder. Um, <laughs> uh, this National Solar Observatory um, during the last few years tried to figure out what are these key questions that DKIST might answer. And there were a series of workshops all organized all over the world, uh, getting uh, input from scientists all over the world trying to figure out what are these questions. And then the science group gathered to, together trying to make a list of things that are important, uh, which is an extremely complex tasks. In fact, <laughs> this is one of the situations in my life where I really felt that the list of questions is so long that you cannot even capture it in your brain. <laughs> Because it, yeah, it is an extremely complex instrument with a huge number of questions that it might answer. So on a little bit of a more personal note, we wanted to ask you, is you, you have such a varied background. You, your native language is Russian, but you also speak English and Spanish and German. You're a classical singer and a pianist and a rock climber. <laughs> you kind of give us an idea of kind of where you started with all of this and how you ended up being a solar physicist. 
Yeah, good question. Um, I don't know how did I become a solar physicist. I always was just curious about everything. And I always was very lucky to be, including now, to be surrounded by very, very nice people and very talented people. So I always just followed my passions. When, uh, when I was, um, when I was uh, in the kindergarten, somebody has noticed me singing <laughs> in the kindergarten. I was invited to to go to the music school in uh, Russia along with a general school. And I was playing piano and singing there. And uh, then I went to the English speaking school when I was age of seven, I really liked languages. And five years long, uh, later, I already spoke English. So I started learning German. <laughs> so I guess every time I was born, something uh, new popped up and then eventually solar physics. But if I could, I, I would uh, have gladly lived several lives, that's for sure. <laughs> so I don't think that, for example, solar physics is better than uh, being an opera singer. It uh, sounds like you're kind singing. of doing that, you know, living several lives right now, doing all of these cool things that you do. It, it feels like you're, you know, <laughs> living these, all these simultaneous, very cool experiences. <laughs> I mean, for sure, one of the reasons I selected solar physics is because uh, people are super nice and you really live a cool life. Yes, being um, you get to travel, you get to do so many things at once and you have all the flexibility in the world to do whatever you like. Yes. Did you go to school in Russia and then come to the U.S. or did you go to school in the U.S. or some other country? What was your kind of schooling background? Uh, so I uh, I went to university at St. Peter in St. Petersburg, Russia, for and I get got a math degree there as an undergrad, and then I went for summer school to um, Sunspot, New Mexico, uh, which is a very small town, uh, to do like a summer internship in solar physics, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, then I, without thinking too much, <laughs> I sent my application to do graduate school in solar physics. And to Bozeman, Montana. That's one of the um, famous solar physics groups along with Colorado. And I got accepted and then uh, I went there for a physics degree and solar physics um, to do solar physics research. I really enjoyed it. Then uh, I applied for um, NSF fellowship to do postdoc uh, at Berkeley, UC Berkeley. And I was very lucky again uh, to end up in a solar theory group at UC Berkeley. Uh, and then um, when uh, Dickest um, became suddenly a thing, although it was a thing already when I was an intern in Sunspot, New Mexico in 2004, uh, they were thinking about, uh, they were working actively on developing ATST, Advanced Technology Solar Telescope, that was later renamed to be Dickest. At that time, I just started so doing solar physics. And uh, then in 2000. 18, so 15 years later, almost, uh, DCAST became a real thing. And of course, I applied to become a professor here <laughs> to, to work with DCAST data. So that was only two years ago. And um, I became lucky to move to Boulder, Colorado to work uh, on this project. And now we're getting closer to getting the data from this uh, unique instrument. Uh, so one thing that we always kind of like to ask as we wrap these episodes up is if, if listeners, uh, Maria, if you could have listeners walk away from this episode with one major takeaway, what would it be? If you want people to walk away, you know, and obviously you, you, they can't remember all the details of the episode, but you want them to, one thing to stick in their minds, what would it be? Anything that you would want people to walk away with? We're now living in the golden age of solar astronomy. There are several instruments being developed or that have been sent that will help us to answer some of the key questions about our sun. Solar Orbiter, DCAST, Parker Solar Probe, um, all are coming online. And with this, we'll have better understanding of what's going on in the solar poles. Now we have no idea. What's causing this very hot corona that's much hotter than the surface? We don't know that. And um, how to predict solar flares, we're still uh, doing a pretty bad job with, all, uh, with this. Very cool. And, uh, anything... just to, and just, to, oh, and just uh, to add one thing to this is that Boulder is a very unique place. Uh, I would say it's the solar capital in the world that allows you 
not just build instruments, but also get a very deep background in solar theory or solar observations. So if you're interested in the sun, go to CU Boulder. <laughs> Go Buffs. You know, it's funny. That's the other question that we ask a lot is what advice do you give to people that are inspired to study in your field? The advice, go to CU Boulder. Yes, I would say solar physics is actually <laughs> is very good uh, area. If you're interested in the sun, uh, solar physics is a very good area and very dynamic area. And it's also uh, quite small area. So you know almost everybody in your field. People are nice to each other because it's a small field most of the time. And uh, also there are lots of unanswered questions. There are lots of phenomen still phenomenological questions about the sun that haven't been addressed, being, meaning that you open the shutter of your telescope and there is a new, a new kind of phenomenon. So it's very exciting. All right, so that is our time. Thank you again so much, Maria, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Sarah. My pleasure. And that wraps things up for this episode of A View from Earth. Uh, we'd like to thank again our guests, Drs. Adam Kowalski and Maria Kazachenko for giving us their time and telling us a bit about solar physics, uh, the second time in, in A View from Earth. Uh, again, the extended interviews are always available on YouTube and SoundCloud. So if either of those really struck you and, and you want to find out more, uh, go ahead and check those out. Um, now, typically is when I would say, hey, stay tuned for next week. Uh, we're going to be talking to so-and-so and so-and-so -so about what, what you have it. But this is a special episode. This is the last episode of A View from Earth Season 1. So that's kind of a big deal. Uh, but uh, very excitingly, if that's a word, uh, we have been approved for the extended mission of A View from Earth. So stay tuned for Season 2, which will come to you sometime in the fall. We'll make sure to keep putting out updates as we kind of learn more about what this will look like, um, which can be viewed on our website, colorado.edu forward slash FISC. Um, and from our website, you can also uh, send us any questions that you have that you'd like us to maybe ask our experts in the second season of A View from Earth. And also, and this is kind of a new thing, you'll have the option to donate and contribute to the success of A View from Earth. Um, obviously, this is a, a pressing time for everybody in the, in the pandemic, so we really appreciate your support. Uh, this podcast is on YouTube, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. And from us here at A View from Earth, we would like to thank you, the listeners, for being the most important part of our show. <laughs> Exit stage right. You know that is going to be how I end the episode. <laughs> I'm just going to take just going to take that clip and tag it on at the end. Are we still here or <laughs> Yes we are. All right. Mm. Yeah.